variant of this picture before. It is the general architecture of Flink. So up to this point, most talks focus on the upper layers. I call them the user layer, which contains the core APIs, the data stream API for streaming, and some libraries on top of it. So what we're doing, going to do today, actually, is focus on the lower layers. So we are going to look into the runtime of Flink and actually see how stuff is executed. So the goal for today is really to take this journey from the API to the parallel execution of a program. And as a disclaimer, this is all stuff you don't have to worry about when you write your programs in the higher, level, higher levels. OK? So when we start, there are basically three components. The first one on the user side is the client, also hidden from your program. And the Flink system is made up of the master node, the job manager, and one or more worker nodes, the task managers. So what we will go through is this. The client will submit the program to the master node. The master node will schedule this for execution. The workers will execute it. And then you will get back the results. So the first step here is that the, the API program you write in the data stream API, API, for example, is translated to a data flow. This data flow is called job graph in Flink. And this is, it's really a one-to-one -one translation of your program to a DAG structure. And this DAG is actually quite simple. So the building blocks are vertices and results. The vertices are representing your computation and the intermediate results, the data, which is produced by this um, computation. So the relation we have is a job vertex produces one or more results, and a intermediate result is consumed again by a, by a vertex. So this looks very simple, but actually it is quite powerful because you can rearrange this to form a quite complex DAG, and for example, represent a program like this, where you flow from the sources to the sinks, but you can have multiple of, this, of these. So this source here is producing two results, which is consumed by one sink, or this vertex here is consuming uh, two results as well, and so on. So this is actually quite a powerful abstraction, and this is the first step into Flink. And this happens behind the scenes. This is actually happening when you create the execution environment and um, execute the execute method. This is what happens in the background, the translation here. So actually, it's not just a one-to-one -one translation. What already happens is that you can already start optimizing. So one thing, that, one thing that happens is called chaining. If you have, for example, a source and then a mapper, this will, in most cases, be chained together to just one task, which produces a single result. And depending on the API you use, you even get more complex optimizations. For example, with the dataset API, you will also run the cost-based optimizer during this translation process. And the important thing to note here is that this abstraction is actually independent of the data stream API and the data set API. So it's actually, it's like one common abstraction for both APIs and it's independent of them. So what we will see later on is that actually the question of which API is running, it's just like different parameters to this job graph. Um, the common parameters, the important parameters are, for example, the parallelism of certain vertices, then the code which runs inside of these vertices, and other stuff which, which we'll get into. Um, any questions up until this point? OK. So actually, what happens now after the translation has happened is that the client and the job manager need to communicate somehow. And this in Flink happens via ECTOS. All coordination happens via ECTOS specifically with uh, ACAS actor implementation. And actors are a very nice abstraction um, centered around uh, the exchange of asynchronous messages between actors. So everything here, like the client, job manager, and the task managers are actors. And each actor ha has, their, has his own state. So the job submission is also one of these messages. 
So the client will translate the program to a job graph, put it into a, an ACA message, and submit it to the cluster for execution. So actually, this is already the first step. This was the step into the system. We have now translated the program to a structure the Flink system understands and given it to the system. So now if you look at to the job manager, as I've said before, the job manager is the master node. And this means it is responsible for all the coordination within your uh, running job. So for example, scheduling of the program or the coordination of checkpoints. There will also be a talk about this later today by Till. And monitoring the workers. And up to this point, this job graph structure was actually just a logical abstraction without any parallelism. And what the job manager does when it receives this job graph is it actually spans it out to a parallel structure, which is called the execution graph. So this is still a logical abstraction, though. So what happened now is that this one job vertex became multiple execution vertices, and the result is now partitioned over these multiple execution vertices. So, so this is actually the first time um, your program is parallelized. Also, so there's a logical structure in the job manager. Nothing has been executed yet. Um, and this was also a parameter to this job graph. So before, we didn't really think about how the job graph, uh, job vertices, and the results were connected. But now we are in the parallel world, and we have to think about it. There are two distribu distribution patterns in Flink between results and vertices. The one is point to point. It's pretty straightforward. And the other is all to all. So an all to all exchange is, for example, what happens if you have a map and a reduce in repositioning the data. So now we have the parallel execution graph, and we want to execute it. Execution happens on the task manager. The task managers are the beefy processes who do all the work. And they also communicate with the job manager via actor messages. But they also have their own dedicated data connections for the data exchange, exchange within the, during the execution. So the question actually now is, how do we get from the job manager execution graph to the task managers. So what you see here is that each task manager exposes one or more task slots, and the, and the job manager can schedule tasks, tasks in these task slots. So if you take an example here, we have, an ex we have a job graph. The parallelism of the first two nodes is four. The last node here has parallelism of three and the distribution pattern is pointwise and all-to-all. This translates to a execution graph on the job manager. You see here parallelism of four, and the last node has parallelism of three. So what now happens is that the job manager wants to schedule this on the task managers. Here both task managers expose three task slots. And interestingly, what Flink does is it tries to schedule a whole pipeline of operations in the task managers. So this parallel, all the parallel subtasks on the left are scheduled together in one task slot on the task manager, each running in their own thread. And giving th this gives you nice um, attributes like local exchange. This is, for example, stuff that Matthias also talked about. And yeah, this goes on. And one possible scheduling could be this. Yeah, where these three are scheduled here, and the last one also on the second task manager. OK, so after the job has been submitted to one or more task managers, the task manager and job manager communication is pretty straightforward. This happens also via actor messages and in the form of task state updates, updates actually. So you submit the job, the tasks have a state like um, deploying, and during runtime, they send updates to the job manager all the time. And what the job manager does is it actually takes care of um, coordinating the different tasks each execution is in. 
So this is the, ta the states a task can be in, a execution can be in. At the job manager side, it's not that important actually, just for completeness. But the updates to the states happen asynchronously. This is from messages from the client, for example, you have your job running, the client wants to cancel this, the job manager gets a cancel message and all the, all the tasks which were running, for example, switch to fail. Um, yes. At the task managers, at the, on the other hand, um, so here, um, this structure, you see, contains the information about the whole program. At the point where it gets to a task manager, it's actually quite local. So the abstraction at the task manager is just a task, and it's pretty stupid in the sense that it doesn't know anything. It just knows which code to execute, where to get the results from, and which results to produce. So if you think about the job graph, you know the code which runs here, where you get your results from, and which results you put out. And this is actually, let's skip he to here. So if you have your user code, for example, in this flat map, you have a user-defined function to split by white space. This will be running inside the user code. For example, the for loop here will be wrapped in the task as the user code. Outside of it will be some operator code, which is provided by the Flink runtime, for example, for the flat map which is taking care of reading the data and giving it to the user function. And the outermost circle um, is the task environment. This is al also taken care of by Flink to set up the consumed and produced results. Um, and the nice thing here is really that you don't notice all this stuff. You just write this here. The Flink community has written nice operators wrapping this stuff up. And the runtime is completely agnostic to this. So in this case, this is a stream data. Str this is the data stream API. So the operators here are the streaming operators. For the data set case, this will be the data set operators. So, but the nice thing, nice thing is that to the runtime, this is totally um, independent. Doesn't make a difference. So just taking some code and executing it. So the question now is, how do how do the operators or the user code gets the results. So what happens is that if this is your task, you have structures called input gates, which you also don't see, but the operators see this. And on the first read, you request a result. So you know, for example, you request the result with ID X, and you know where to find this result. If it's a remote task manager, you s initiate a TCP connection to the remote task manager. So this is a new connection between these two task managers. The task manager has a so-called network manager, which takes care to initiate this um, protocol, requests the partition, and now you have a new connection between these two task managers where the data is read. The local part is actually easier. If it's a local result you are interested in, you just ask your own result manager. OK? So, and the interesting thing here is that these results in Flink, they can have different uh, characteristics depending on the type of job you are running. So, two questions you can ask about these results is how and when is data exchange happening? This is like pipeline versus blocking results. And how long to keep the results around? So, most of the results right now are ephemeral and they are lost after execution, but you can also have checkpointed results which stay around longer. So to make this a little bit more concrete, for a pipeline result in a simple map reduce setting, the map operator gets data from somewhere, uh, transforms it, and then writes it out to a result. Because this is a pipeline result, this will trigger the scheduling of the following task. In this case, this is a reduce. Um, so this means that there is a job manager, the job manager is involved for scheduling this during runtime. And now this data production happens in a pipeline fashion and continues. Okay, the interesting thing here is that is the result was not finished before when the reduce came online. So 
at this point, for example, both operators are online at the same time, and the map operator keeps producing data while the reduce is fetching it. So actually, this is the result type we use for streaming programs. So in your streaming programs, all results are pipelined. Um, what we also have for the dataset API are blocking results. In this case, the whole result needs to be produced before the following operators can be scheduled. So in this case, the whole result has been produced. And now we bring up the reducer. And this can now start fetching the result. So why is this interesting? So actually, if you have, for, for the streaming jobs, it's actually quite clear. You use the pipeline result, and you get some nice properties like low latency. But why is this also interesting for batch pipelines? So for example, you can imagine you have this whole large pipeline, but most of the data exchanges can be, depending on the operation to use, also streamed. So there's no law prohibiting batch programs to use pipeline exchanges. So this is nice, because we here get lower latency. But maybe some other operators also need blocking, because this takes up huge amounts of resources. So maybe after this operation, you want to block. So you produce your pipeline until here, then you block, and then you continue. So if you now recap this, we saw all three components, client, job manager, and task manager. The coordination on both the client and job manager is happening via actors. They're just exchanging coordination messages. The task manager is doing this as well, but furthermore, has dedicated data connections to do the data exchange. The central abstractions were the job graph, execution graph, and the task. And the state, tr the state view or the state tracking on the job manager is always referring to the complete program. And on the task manager, it's just a single task. So it's very local. Um, actually, I removed some slides, but we have time left. So if you think about this question of streaming versus batch processing in Flink, the nice thing is that the question of streaming and batch is just are just different parameters to this job graph and to the runtime. So because everything goes down to the same runtime, it's actually independent. So Slim also asked this this morning uh, to William, how this is hap happening. So maybe you now have a better picture of this. And it's also a good thing that streaming always comes first, because we can then always also exploit it in batch programs. Um, but we have still enough flexibility to have special code paths for batch where it's applicable. For example, the cost based optimization on the translation to the job graph or the blocking results for less resource fragmentation. So essentially, the data stream and data set API are just different param parameters or parameters to the job graph. Yeah. And we can also look at this question of how long to keep results around. So for ephemeral results, you produce the result, in this case also pipelined. And after you have consumed it, you just get rid of it. So this is the case for most streaming programs where you don't want to reuse the intermediate results again. But for blocking results, what you can, for data set, um, for data set programs, what you can do is use checkpointed results where you produce the result, and actually the result stays in the task manager. For example, if you want to recover later um, on a failed data set job. Yeah. So that was a rather quick overview of the runtime. Um, I hope you have questions, which I'm happy to take now. Is there any way to associate um, the task uh, scheduling with the uh, resources in the system? 
So uh, to achieve data locality and uh, make sure that large states are divided between different machines and things like that. So. I didn't get the question. Uh, can you can you associate um, the task scheduling with um, resource uh, resource um, allocation in the in the physical yeah, hardware? Yes, so. yes, definitely. For example, for sources which read from HDFS, we schedule them also on the close to the data, and also from the job graph, job graph extraction, we know where we scheduled like predecessors to certain tasks. So. Um, if you look at this here, when we do this translation, we know that these end up on the same machine. There's a concept of a task slot sharing group in Flink, which takes care of this. Hi, Hi. Uh, nice talk. I have a question. Um, when you translate your job graph into the execution graph, is yep. there any um, optimization during runtime? So can the execution graph change during execution? I'm asking um, because of uh, a problem I have. So if I, for example, um, I group my data and I have a very uh, high imbalance between my groups and then I apply a group reduce function. Mm -hmm. And what I would expect is that uh, the group that has most of the data in it would, uh, would be partitioned at runtime internally. Does something like this happen or? Right now, no. But there are plans to do this, to react to this kind of skew, for example. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's a question. checkpointed results recovered in case of failures, for example, when machines die? Sorry? So Check the checkpointed results that you talked about in the very mm -hmm. end, uh, how are they recovered in case uh, the machines die? So what you can do is you can have them replicated. This is not implemented right now, but you can easily replicate them after production to multiple task managers. Yeah. Does it answer the question? Actually, I have two questions. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the streaming API of Flink mm -hmm. yet, but what do you do if you have uh, some kind of blocking results? Mm -hmm. So if you use such operators, what happens? In the streaming uh, world, you actually only group in Windows. Mm -hmm. So because the stream never stops, you introduce this concept of Windows to actually make the stream part of the stream finite, where you can do operations like joining or grouping. And in this case, the task operator just waits for the data to arrive until it has everything to fire, to trigger the window. And the second question, how do you specify which results you want to be checkpointed? Um, currently, you cannot explicitly specify this. So, wha so what are the current but plans But you can easily that? add an API method like uh, on the data set dot checkpoint, and this could just be kept around in the task managers. Uh, I have one question. Uh, I, I saw that normally Flint will try to allocate tasks within the same worker. Yeah. But what happens in Jarn mode? For example, uh, when you use Jarn, how, how this happens, the job manager tells Jarn, okay, I, I want resources in this, just in this, in, in this machine so I can allocate many tasks in the same or? Uh, to my knowledge, this is not happening at the moment. So actually, sorry. Each task slot is per default one container in Yarn, and you don't have any guarantees whether they end up on the same physical machine or, or don't. No, no, actually, I, I don't know. I, I ah. just asking, asking you that, actually. I, I didn't get the question then. I mean, for example, when you, dip, when you run Flink with Yarn, yeah? how, how does the job manager tell the, the resource manager of, of Yarn to allocate the resources? Does it try to ask you, okay, give me more resources in the same machine? So I can get locality or? I don't think there's a concept of locality in this case. It just requ requests any container and depends on what Jan gives it. Maybe we can also talk about this offline if you want to. I'm not, not sure if I understood the, the question completely, but um, if, you, if you go to this picture of um, on, on the next slide, I think you actually see that a lot of tasks reuse the same container in Yarn, right? So if you, no, if you have one not. task and you have, another, uh, you have another task which basically consumes the result of the first one, they usually end up with the same container anyway. So this is it's basically the best locality you, you can get. If you, have, um, if, if you cannot end up reusing the container, these are mostly cases when you're basically shuffling the data anyways and when, when the lo locality is basically 
it's basically voided anyways because you're like redistributing 90%, 99% of the data anyways. So that's a good point. What he meant is that, for example, this task slot would be on one container in Yarn, and these would end up on the container, same on the same container then. Yeah. There is another question here. Uh, as I understood that you pipeline everything yeah. until a point that you say that we the resources possible, so we always yeah, try to pipeline. Possible, then you do a block. Is yeah. this a bottleneck or something? Isn't it going to produce a bottleneck for the processing because you're stopping everything at a certain point S so this blocking and then only you're continuing? Uh, in the data set, AP in data set programs, and there sometimes you just need to block. If you want to sort the whole input, yeah, you need but to first in this way, like uh, you're not getting the benefit from having a pipeline before. Uh, it depends really on the operator. So there are cases where you need to do this. Uh, for example, in other systems, it actually happens always between a shuffle. So always when you have a connection from one task manager to the next and you need to repartition the data, you always block the execution. You fully produce the result, and then the next stage continues. So this is something you usually do in anyways. So because I noticed that the best performance that I got from Flink is mm -hmm. when it pipelines everything. Where there is more than one stage because yeah, but of this the really blocking, on the, the job performance on the operators you use. Okay. And the characteristics of the data. Yeah. So it might be the case that you, for example, on the first shuffle you need to sort the data, but then on the next shuffle you can reuse partitionings and then you don't can pipeline this. So it's hard to answer for all cases. But the general idea is to pipeline where possible. And we're not, we block. Yeah, so here, ah, sorry. Can you go please to the previous slide? I, I hope I remember correctly. To the previous slide? Yeah, number 11, yes. Um, can it happen that, for example, when you create the execution graph for mm -hmm. whatever program, that the number of task slots that are exposed in total in the system is less than the number of operators? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. What happens then? Then you get an exception that not enough resources are available. Oh, okay. But uh, th there's not, not much you can do about it, right? So if you um, have a program and want to execute it with a higher parallelism, then you have cores in your system. Um, it's a bad idea anyways. So what you usually do is you set the number of task slots on the task manager to the number of cores you have. So, yeah. Uh, sorry, Jamie. Um, so on the, maybe on the next slide, when I'm looking at a uh, task manager and then these slots, this abstraction called mm -hmm. a slot, what, how do I interpret that in terms of what's a container, what's a process, and what's a thread? So in the actual if you go, yeah, here. So each of these is a real thread. Okay. All running in this one, each task manager is a process. Yep. Running these threads, and these task slots are actually just a... Uh, Logical abstraction, so to speak. Okay, so it's a thread per uh, operator. A thread per operator. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Stefan wants to add something. I think the, the only thing that I think the only thing that is really done per slot is um, is the is the resource accounting. So, for example, each of these task slots will have a certain amount of reserved memory in the managed uh, memory manager, right? So basically all operators that go to the same slot will, up, will end up sharing a certain budget of memory. And, and so, I mean, for example, in the streaming API, you can say break, break the chain or break the resource group, and then the next operator will go to a different slot, right? Which means that you will end up needing more slots to execute the streaming program, but it also means that the next operator will not have to share its memory with the previous operator anymore, right? So there, basically, a slot is, a, is an accounting unit of, of managed memory in Flink. On one of the slides, you had uh, quite a large job graph. And that got me thinking about uh, how large job graphs are you aiming to handle in Flink? Maybe hundreds of nodes or even thousands? Really depends on what you do um, mm -hmm. in these pipelines. So we have seen, sorry, this animation, I cannot skip it. We have seen, I think this job graph, that you, uh, this graph you saw there was a real use case. Mm -hmm. So you easily end up with this huge graphs when you use the higher level APIs, for example, for machine learning where you do a lot of pre-processing, then you have the algorithm, often with an iteration, and then you do something with the result. So, but it, again, it's hard to answer uh, in a general sense. Yeah. 
And we have some time for one more question. Who's, uh, who's responsible in this case for handling errors? Uh, like always the task. The task handles? The ta yeah, the task fails then and sends the error to the job manager, which then usually either restarts the program or reports it back to the client. Okay, and for like out of memory errors or just things that are environmental? There you cannot do much in the JVM. Then you will actually use the uh, JVM and you have to restart it. Okay, does, but does, any, does, does somebody restart it or? I mean uh, like depends so you're on talking about the streaming thing, right? So this is gonna be always on all the time. I uh, assume eventually these processes will crap out. And no, I, I wouldn't assume that. So, <laughs> so actually. Um, you're gonna say 10 years per process or something? Depends on how you, what you do with the objects, right? If you create too many objects, too large objects, you can definitely crash your JVM, but this is not the usual case. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know, my experience with JVMs is that you usually recycle them on a pretty regular basis for, okay. you, just, you just recycle them in but a then good spot, right? Then it's also okay if the job fails, you can easily restart it. So for example, if you run it with Yarn, high availability, the containers will be restarted and your job should continue. So in the, streaming, in the streaming job, you would recover from the latest completed checkpoint and restart the whole topology with new processes and new containers when necessary. Yes. Yeah. Um, you propose a quite efficient and straightforward scheduling policy here. Mm -hmm. um, how would you compare this approach comparing to Quincy, the Dryad scheduler? Uh, from Microsoft, oh, I'm from Microsoft Research. I'm not familiar with the right scheduler, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so Dryad is the dependency graph. Dryad is dependency graph between mm -hmm. task and resources, mm -hmm. and dynamically update the weight uh, between the uh, task and resources to assign the best um, resources to the right task. Did you get this? No, we don't do this in any case. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Slim has a question. Oh, sorry, yeah. I didn't see you. Yeah, sorry. just a quick question. Uh, how do you handle iterations? Could you talk a bit more about that? Because it's supposed to be different from like Spark, how they handle iterations. If yeah, you have that's, an algorithm. that's actually a good point. I didn't show iterations in the job graph because actually they are a user level concept. So we have a back channel in the program. So iteration support is only in the dataset API at the moment and in beta also in the streaming API but the iterations you're referring to are probably from the dataset API, and they are handled as an in-memory channel flowing back from one vertex to another. So all also on a managed memory, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Hey, and also Slim had a question. Ah, um, so you mentioned recovering from a checkpoint. Yeah. So what, what are the guarantees for whatever consumes stuff from that checkpoint? Is it, uh, can you, uh, guarantee like an exactly once semantics yeah, or the, at least once or yeah, exactly once semantics and there will be a talk later today from Till exactly about this topic. I could have just yeah, you could choose either exactly once, which you, get, you can choose either exactly once or at least once depending on, on, on what your application wants. That was a question. Still some time for questions. No time, or there's, there's still time, right? Yeah, it's until four. Yep. Yeah, uh, thank you for a great uh, presentation. My question is uh, the following. Uh, are there any opportunities to make uh, the runtime uh, more robust? Uh, because other like uh, big data framework, I don't name it this time, they have to make major changes to uh, support uh, streaming. I know that uh, here uh, from the beginning you support streaming, but are there any opportunities to make uh, even the runtime more robust, especially, especially when you start uh, supporting other uh, workloads uh, from machine learning, from graph processing, yeah, you name it. Thank you. Um, at this point, this is al already rather robust because uh, most operator, all operators on the dataset API, for example, work on, on their own memory budget. So actually you don't often see out of memory errors because of the system. 
So actually, only the user code can cause out-of-memory errors. Um, but this is always the case. Um, yeah. So and actually, this is also the runtime is agnostic to this. So all this logic is implemented in the operators. Uh, is it possible to run multiple DAGs on the task managers? So say you had uh, two yeah. separate. Yeah, if you have enough slots available, this is possible. Yeah. So uh, who decides uh, how many task slots will be available in each of the task manager? Is it user who specifies it? Yeah, the guy who operates the cluster. Okay, so if so it's if like if it's I you, you, you decide it, yes. Uh, but but can can um, can the user specify it specifically? Let's if, if if it's a heterogeneous cluster, and if I don't understand, uh, maybe I understand it incorrectly. But the task manager is is um, um, separate for each node. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you have like a heterogeneous cluster, is there any way that the system admin uh, can specify that, let's say, this task manager should have these many yeah. slots and yeah. these guys there, should there's have? There's a conflict flag for each task manager. Okay. And a conflict flag for each task manager. If you set the flag accordingly, you mm -hmm. will expose that many slots. Okay. So, at, at the moment, there is no like adaptive way to. At the moment, al no. Allocated. Yeah. And, and as a user in your program, you can always set the parallelism either mm -hmm. of the execution environment. Mm -hmm. This will then also be like sped out to this parallelism and then to the slot, okay. number of okay. slots. Thank you. Maybe one more question. One small additional question yeah. about data locality, especially on Yarn. Uh, you know, initially when it actually loads the data from HDFS, mm -hmm. what kind of data locality can it actually make use of then? The locality also get with other systems. I mean, so you yes, the actually mm -hmm. it actually loads the data so if it's locally on the same machine as the task manager, it will prefer to load those yeah, files. Yeah, definitely. It will always be preferred to have the task on the same machine, yeah. if not possible, on another machine. So you won't see any failures, but. Um, and this assignment happens during runtime dynamically, so you usually get very good locality. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs>